Welcome to So True. And today's devotional is entitled, um, Treated as an Individual. And it's based on Isaiah 40, 25 to 26. In fact, let me take time to read that text. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. During the American Civil War, Senator Charles Sumner, captured by his grand plans for the abolition of slavery, was asked by Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, to meet some friends who'd suffered grievously because of slavery. To her surprise, the senator declined and dismissed the request in a condescending manner. Really, Julia, I have lost all interest in individuals. She shot back, why, Charles? God hasn't gone as far as that yet. Julia Ward Howe is right. While God has a great plan for all of history, echoing out into eternity, he never loses interest in individuals. God in his kindness and love treats us as individuals. When God looks upon his creation, he sees us in color and everything else in black and white. We stand out to him. We're not lost in the crowd. He sees us and cares about what we care about. In fact, if we doubt that or even begin to question that, then we should step outside for a bit and learn a lesson from the stars in the evening sky. In Isaiah 40 that we just read, the prophet calls us to lift our eyes on high and survey the stars that God has created and consider the fact that when he calls them out at night, he calls them all by name. In fact, that truth is repeated in Psalm 147 verse 4. Not only did God create these stars, but he holds them in their place, and he knows each one by name. The magnitude of that picture and the magnitude of that proposition staggers our minds. Think about this. The Milky Way alone is said to home 300 billion stars. If we took one-third of that number, say 100 billion stars, and started counting one star per second— it would take us two and a half thousand years to complete the task. God's complete and instant knowledge of the stars speaks of his greatness, of his omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. Now, here's the comforting truth. Here's the pastoral practice and practical application of this. There are no solitary stars and there are no solitary saints. If God's providential care of the starry sky is so exacting and so individualized that he knows every one of them by name, and not one of them is missing because he upholds them all by the word of his power, how dare we ever think that God is removed from and unmoved by the littlest details of our lives? Our troubles are not trifling to God. Our interests are not uninteresting to him. Our heaviness of heart carries weight with him. In fact, let me just go on a little excursion here for a couple of minutes as I thought through some verses that jumped to my memory about what God knows about you and about me. We could go to Job 23 verse 10. God knows our way. Job is going through um, a valley of tears. Job is going through um, a, a ringer of suffering, and, and he's, he's, he believes that God is in the midst of his suffering. God has permitted this, and God has purposed this, and when he comes out the other side of this awful experience, he will be the better for it. He says in Job 23, verse 10, God knows the way I take, and when I am come forth, I will be as gold. God knows our way. Secondly, God knows our wants. I love Matthew 6, verse 8, as Jesus preempts what he's about to teach us on how to pray, and he gives us 
uh, the Lord's Prayer, as, or more accurately, the disciples' prayer, what, is, what his disciples ought to pray. Uh, he tells us before he utters those famous words, um, Our Father in heaven, that before we go to God and ask him for something, God knows what we need before we utter a word. And I love that. Isn't it wonderful to know in the midst of all of our needs, physical, emotional, financial, circumstantial, um, relational, we could go on, that God knows those needs and he will meet those needs uh, within his will at the right time and the right proportion. And so God knows our ways. God knows our wants. Thirdly, God knows our weakness. Here I'm thinking about Psalm 103 and verse 14, where the Bible tells us that God knows our frame or our physical makeup, and he remembers that we are but dust. He understands our weakness, our susceptibility to sickness, uh, how our strength can wane under pressure. God knows that. In fact, think about this in the incarnation of Jesus Christ as Christ added humanity to his deity without corruption or confusion. We know from Hebrews chapter 4, 14, 15, and 16 that the Lord is touched with the feeling of our infirmity, our weakness. God knows our weakness, and, and through Christ, um, uh, he, he, he uh, sympathizes with us, and there is strength and mercy when we go to him, our great high priest, in the midst of our weakness. So um, that's a wonderful insight and inspiration. Fourthly, there's probably more. I'm going to stay with these four. God knows our whereabouts. Um, God knows our, our way. He knows our, our um, wants. And he, he, he knows uh, our, our whereabouts. And uh, in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 3, we read that when we sit down, when we stand up, God knows. In fact, his presence and his knowledge of our situation encompasses us or hedges us in. I also like Revelation 2, verse 13, concerning the church of Pergamos, where, where the Lord Jesus says, I, I, I know your works and I know where you dwell or where you live, even where Satan's throne is. Um, God knows our zip code. Um, what, what a wonderful encouragement if, if you're a believer in North Korea or in, in the Middle East or uh, somewhere where you're in a, a, a great minority and, and, and feeling, uh, you know, the, the hot breath of the evil one on your neck. God knows where you live. Maybe you live in a tough area, in a crime-infested neighborhood. God knows where you live. He treats us as individuals. Look, as I wrap this up, uh, looking over a calm sea one evening and a, cl a clear starlit night, uh, an officer stood on the bridge of a ship that was chugging its way across the Atlantic. And he said to his captain, it's easy to believe in God on a night like this, sir. The captain snapped back, yes, a God who is as cold as the sea and as far away as those stars. The captain was wrong. I feel sorry for him that he doesn't understand the God we're coming to understand in this little devotional, the God who knows us and understands us, the God who is not removed and unmoved. God knows us, invites us to know him through his son, Jesus Christ, who was born beneath a star. John 17 verse 3 tells us that eternal life is to know God and, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Look, in the Lord Jesus Christ, God says to us, I see you, I know you, and I love you. Know this, God knows you. And here's a closing thought to add to the others. And he has known you for a long time. Because according to Romans 8, 29 to 30, he has predestinated you or predestined you to eternal life, to salvation based on his foreknowledge of you. And uh, so God has known you for a long time and he loves you deeply. And I hope that is a great encouragement to you today.